Hello and welcome to another week of Seeing Jesus More Clearly. My name is Dave Nolette, and listen, if this is your first time joining us uh, and you want to learn more about Shelby, myself, what we're doing here, you can go to our website, bygraceinternational.com. Uh, there you'll also have the option, if, if you've been a long-time watcher, uh, you know, first-time clicker, you can go ahead and uh, if you feel like it, supporting us financially is something you want to do, that's great. We would we would be appreciative. You know, we're, we, we don't put anything behind paywalls here. We're not looking to necessarily strike it rich doing this. Um, you know, we're, we're just looking to get out what, what we're seeing in the Bible, what we're seeing as we study the scripture and, and so on and so forth. And really, um, the more people that we can provide this benefit to, the better. And, and so, you know, if that's something that you feel like you'd like to do, uh, we welcome it. We appreciate it. If not, no worries. Sit here, enjoy, sit back, relax. It's going to be fun. We are looking um, today, or, or rather over the next couple of weeks, at this idea of God, you know, who is God? And this is, this is a question that we see come up time and time again, um, where, where people have thoughts, they have conversations, they have ideas about God and the very nature of the Godhead, the very nature of God, and, and really try to wrestle um, with this idea of who is God? Who, who do we define God as? Because really, uh, if, you're, if you're a Christian or a person of faith, uh, how you answer this question ultimately determines your reality. And uh, unfortunately, I, I, I hate to say it, but there's a number of people today who would call themselves Christians who can't answer that question well. Um, they can't answer it well, number one. Or number two, they often fail to recognize that there is a need for us to wrestle with and to grapple with the Scripture. You know, there's, um, I, I think over the last few years, and, you know, it, it probably started long before this, but, you know, I'm, I'm coming up on my 34th birthday here in a couple weeks, and I've noticed over the last probably five or six years that uh, in, in the evangelical, charismatic, Pentecostal camps that Shelby and I grew up with, we've, we've become far more interested in rote, precise, this is the answer, that's what it is, period. And anything that kind of questions, you know, those preconceived or pre-built narratives, we don't have any time for. Um, when, when in reality, you know, taking the scripture uh, seriously, taking our faith seriously, as believers, oftentimes necessitates us asking hard questions. It necessitates us grappling with scriptures, wrestling with different concepts, and trying to, to make sense of this whole thing, make sense of, of, of who we see God as in the scriptures. So before we begin, I want to first define a concept for those of you who aren't familiar, and it's this idea of immutability. Immutability, you say, what on earth is that? That sounds like a big word. Well, simply, it just means this. It means God cannot change. Now, um, this is a, a very commonly held belief in Christianity. It's that this idea that God is God and God is God forever. There is no changing within him at all. There's no, there's no space for it. There's no um, grounds for it. There's no allowance for it. Whatever, God is not capable of change because God is God. And so I want to take a look here at a few verses first before we, before we get into these concepts. And I want to I talk to you about them here. So Let's start off in Numbers 23, verse 19. This is um, the story of God speaking to the Israelites here. And it says, God is not a human being that he should lie or a mortal that he should change his mind. Has he promised and will he not do it? Has he spoken and will he not fulfill it? So again, we're, we're, we're seeing this idea that God does not change his mind. Um, he'll do what he said. He's, he's spoken. He, he'll fulfill it. He'll, he'll complete whatever it is he said he's going to do. God is not that kind of person. You ever, you ever have that friend that you make plans with, and you call him up, and it's, hey, you know, Joe, let's, let, let's go and meet for dinner tomorrow night. Yeah, yeah, that's a great idea. That's a great idea. And then tomorrow night rolls around, and uh, you either show up, and Joe's nowhere to be found. I've had that happen before. It's not a fun experience. Um, you know, and you can't get a hold of Joe. Or Joe calls you a little bit before and says, hey, I'm sorry, I'm going to have to cancel. Um, and you know, it's, it, it's not just like a one-time thing. It's Joe does this on a regular basis, right? Um, Joe changes his mind, or Jane changes her mind, you know? And, and this is this is the opposite of who God is. This is what we see a lot of people doing, um, but this is not in harmony with who we see God portrayed as in Scripture. Let's keep reading. First uh, Samuel fifteen verse twenty nine. Moreover, the glory of Israel will not recant or change his mind. So so God here is the glory of Israel, uh, for he's not immortal that he should change his mind. 
Psalm 102, 25, long ago you laid the foundations of the earth, and the heavens are the work of your hands. They will perish, the heavens will perish, right? The earth and the heavens will perish, but you endure. They will all wear like a garment. You change them like clothing. They pass away. So, so heaven, earth, everything, it's just, I, I mean, there's no different than me, you know, taking this shirt off and throwing it in the hamper, getting a new shirt. This is, this is nothing to God. But you are the same and your years have no end. So we're seeing, and, and I, I will admit to you, we are doing some, some cherry picking, some uh, proof texting, but I'm not trying to build a complete theological doctrine around this. What I'm doing is, is taking a look at various statements in scripture right now that describe the character of God. And we keep coming back to this idea that God is not changeable. We see this time and time again in the scripture. For I, the Lord, do not change. Therefore you, O children of Jacob, have not perished. Malachi 3.6. Hebrews 6.17, in the same way when God desired to show even more clearly to the heirs of the promise the unchangeable character of his purpose, he guaranteed it by an oath, verse 18, that through two unchangeable things in which it's impossible that God would prove false, we who have taken refuge might be strongly encouraged to seize the hope set before us. Um, so, so two uh, unchangeable things. God's made this promise, and, and he's not going to change. He's not going to change his mind. He's not going to, uh, God's not going to recant on God's words. John one seventeen. every generous act of giving is from above, coming down from the Father of lights with whom there is no variation or shadow due to change. So when, when you look at God, when you see the picture of God, the picture of God that you see and you recognize is the picture of God that defines who God is. This is what we're seeing in the scripture. We see this time and time again, that this is what the scripture seems to bear out, that God does not change. Now, real quick, I, I, I do want to note this here before we continue on. There can be an argument made um, that God did change. Uh, God's mind did change on certain things, right? You've got, uh, remember the story where, you know, uh, <laughs> Moses goes up on the, the mountain for 40 days and 40 nights, and he's up there, and the people are like, where, where did Moses go? Where on earth is he? Where is he? Uh, Aaron, you need, to, you need to do something here. We, make us gods. Moses is gone. God's abandoned us. Aaron, make us gods that we can, um, <laughs> make us gods that we can say that this is who delivered Israel, who brought Israel out of Egypt. So Aaron takes all the gold and silver and throws it in a fire, and somehow, magically, out comes a calf, right? You know, Moses comes down and drops one of the, one of the <laughs> tablets there, you know, worst sinner, they say, breaks all the Ten Commandments at the same time. Um, Aaron says, oh, well, I didn't do it. The, the people made me do it. It just, it just kind of happened here, Moses. I, I, I'm not sure what's going on. And Moses goes back, and they're up there arguing, and God says, Moses, let's just start over with you. We're, we're just going to wipe this whole thing out. We're going to start fresh. God, Moses says, God, you can't do it. You're gonna, you know, you're you're gonna have people saying, "Well, the reason why Yahweh didn't bring the people out of Egypt was because Yahweh wasn't strong enough to do this." So, come on, God, let's 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 think about this here for a second. And God repents, is what the Scripture says. Um, you've also got this idea of Sodom and Gomorrah, where God comes down and he he tells Abraham what's going to happen with Sodom and Gomorrah because of their inhospitality, because of how they treat uh, people who come into their village, how they treat widows and orphans and things like that, right? It was how they treated their neighbor, I think, is what Ezekiel says with regards to it. Um, he says, I'm going to destroy it unless I find 50 righteous people there. And Abraham says, well, hold up, God, hold up. Well, you know, what if he asks for 40? I'll find Abraham. I'll, 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 I'll save it if there's 40. All right, God, I know, I know you said 40, but like maybe we could make it 30? And, and he gets all the way down to 10 before Abraham backs off. Notice that God doesn't ever say no. God just backs off because Abraham has decided he's pushed it far enough. <laughs> and so, you know, you, you can use these verses to argue that there is some changing to God, or, um, you know, some people will say that God, uh, one, one of the workarounds, so this is this idea that God knows every potential conceivable outcome that could exist, um, and in, in that way, you know, he's all-knowing, and God's not going to change along those lines. But, you know, regardless, it, it's at, at the very least, we can say that God's character is the same, right? God's character is largely the same. We, and we see this, you know, throughout scripture. However, th this then introduces us to this idea that there are a few different texts that give us some problems. What do I mean? Well, we, first off, we've got the examples of genocide all throughout scripture. You say genocide? Yeah, genocide all throughout scripture. 
uh, they, they come into Israel in the book of uh, you know, Deuteronomy, book of Judges, and they get there and they're told to wipe out all these people. Wipe out every single one of them. Don't leave any one of them left alive. Uh, or book of Joshua, you see it there. In 1 Samuel, you've got Saul who goes to war. And he says, you know, God says, take out all of them, the, the women, the children, everybody, wipe them all out. And, and he, even the animals, and Saul lets the animals and the, the women and children survive and whatever. So we say that, or we see that there's genocide as an example in the Bible. God ordained, God ordered genocide is what we see. Um, the killing of the firstborn children in Egypt, you know, just just because the the Egyptians held the Israelites in captivity, according to the story there in, in Exodus, um, <laughs> you know, does that does that justify the killing of every single firstborn child? I mean, you know, I I drop dead tonight, like that kind of thing. You know, is that is that fair? No. Um, you know, is that, is, does that seem in line and in harmony with who Jesus is? The plagues that are brought on by Egypt, or, or by God, you know, uh, to, to Egypt. You, you see the, the, the scripture will say things like that, that God allowed these plagues or God caused these different plagues to come. And, and so the, these kinds of texts, and there's, there's more of them um, throughout the scripture, but they present a problem when it comes to, to this idea of, of who God is and trying to, trying to, to discover the true nature of God, discovering God's nature. Um, and, and so, you know, th this really brings us up to a crossroads, right? There's, there's uh, a, a point where we have to now say, okay, well, what are we going to do with regards to blank? And so I, I really see a few ways forward here. Um, you know, the, the, let me pull up my notes here quick. Um, I, I really see three ways forward. The first, the first is to argue that Jesus satisfied God's wrath, right? This is, this is what we commonly see with regards to the penal substitutionary atonement theory, that, that on Jesus, Jesus took all of the wrath of God. He took all of the punishment. He took all of this uh, on himself. And so now God, uh, God sees us through Jesus, And because of this, he now sees us as holy. God now sees us as righteous. God now sees us as um, alive and condemned. We say that Jesus has made all the difference, that, that God used to deal with the world one way, but now because Jesus has come, God is dealing with us in a different way. However, this is, this is problematic for a few reasons. Number one, this makes, this makes Jesus the, the divine antidepressant. You know, God's God's on a God's on a rage bender, ready to destroy humanity, um, until until Jesus comes onto the scene, and then all of a sudden God's God's rage bender is satisfied, is satiated, it goes away. <laughs> and so, you know, this is this is an issue here. Um, the other thing here is that this is this is this idea that that this now introduces the idea of change to God, that God is capable of change, that God could change, because God dealt with us one way, and now because Jesus has come, he's dealing with us in a new and a living way, and, you know, we, we can justify it as much as we want, but just because we justify it doesn't make it right. You know, these, these things, even if we say that Jesus now causes God to interact with us in another way, we still have to grapple with the fact that God treated people a particular way before this. So, you know, in, in my estimation, you know, this is, this is a no-go. I, I don't think we can argue that. Um, th the second one we have to argue, or, or that we could look at and argue, is, is the God of the Old Testament the same as the God of the New Testament? I, is this a different God? Because the character seems so different. Uh, it, it, seems like, it, it seems like this might be the easiest thing to do, where we could say that there is a God of the Old Testament. This God of the Old Testament is not necessarily the same God that we see in Jesus, uh, we see reflected in Jesus. Um, you know, and, and this is really the true nature of God. However, this, this <laughs> instantly presents some problems. It, it, it seems like it's an easy thing to do, but this, interest, this instantly uh, places us within Marcion's heresy. You know, Mar Marcion was an early uh, church father, had some I interesting ideas here, uh, but one which was largely decreed heretical pretty quickly um, was that Yahweh was the creator of all material, 
and uh, he, he referred to Yahweh a, a, as a demiurge, um, and Yahweh was an evil, sadistic being that demanded violence, demanded bloodshed, so on and so forth, um, who, who was subservient to Jesus' father, who we see there throughout uh, in Jesus's life and Jesus's ministry, so so this is this is again how how Marcion held to this, how Marcion believed it. So so he believed Yahweh was this demiurge who created all these different things. He was evil. He was responsible for for the source of evil, the fall of humanity, so on and so forth. Um, and, and then Jesus came, but Jesus did not physically come. There was no, let me say, no physical Jesus. Uh, it only looked like he came in the flesh. The 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 incarnation, uh, the the death, the burial, the resurrection, all those things didn't necessarily happen to a true flesh and blood body. It was only made to appear so. This this is this is Marcion's idea here that Jesus, um, <laughs> you know, Jesus was his father's benevolent and good, but his body is only an imitation, and this presents some problems here for us. Um, so. What, what what are we supposed to take away from this? You know, if if Jesus satiating God's wrath is out, if God being a, the God of the Old Testament and God of the New Testament are, are both out of bounds, and, you know, wh where does this leave us? Um, I, I think this leaves us at, at a pretty simple point in that our views of God, our understanding of God has changed. You say, what, what do you mean by this? Your views of God and your understanding of God has changed. Well, quite simple. I mean that as we've grown as humans, as we've grown as people, the way that we view God, the way that we interact with God, the way that we see God in the scripture, by necessity changes over time. And, and when you begin to look at this, you can start to see this pattern of growth throughout the scriptures. We see that things have changed, that, that later writers were able to say to earlier writers, like, yeah, you said this, but... We see Jesus doing this. Yep, you, you've heard it said, but I say unto you, right? We, we deal with these different things, um, and, and this allows us to grow through the scriptures. We're allowed to grow through and with the scriptures. This allows us to deal with these things. Uh, scriptures, if I could spell scriptures, that would be most helpful. Let's try that again. There we go. Uh, so this allows us to grow and change throughout the scriptures. Um, and, you know, one of the things that this also does is, is it allows us to take the text seriously. Now, there is a big difference here between taking a text seriously and taking a text literally. What do you mean by that? Well, Deuteronomy, according to, to most scholars, most historical accounts, uh, was likely written around the, the 7th, 8th century, somewhere in, in those lines, where Israel and Judea had both been taken over by Assyria. So, so they're under the rule. Let's, let's, let's get this picture here. You've got this nation of Israel um, that is, that's taken over by a foreign power, right? They, they've lost the ability to self-govern. Uh, they've believed themselves to be the chosen people of God, and now they've lost the ability to, to rule for themselves, to, to be in charge, um, to do all of these different things. And, and so then when we, when we see these books, when we see, you know, these different books in the Pentateuch likely written all around a similar time period, um, where we see God writing through or, 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 or commanding certain acts, we have to understand that these books, these historical books, were not necessarily written the same way that we write our history. You see, this, uh, this concept of a factual history, meaning that, that history is supposed to simply tell the events of what happened, is a very relatively modern concept. It's a, it's a very Western idea. In, in this Eastern mindset, uh, the, the point of a historical book wasn't necessarily to convey exactly what happened. The point of the historical book was to convey a greater truth. So th this allows us to now look at these genocide passages through a different lens. You see, uh, the, the instructions to wipe out the Canaanites in the land of Israel, for instance, um, you know, you, you could read them this way. This is one potential meaning or reading of it where, where you can read this n not as God instructing someone to wipe out a people group, but rather that this is, this is reassuring the people of Israel that God had put this land in their hands, that God had delivered the land of Israel, the land of, uh, of Canaan, into the Israelites' hands, and at one day he would restore the kingdom to them again. 
See, that they're, they're using history to tell a story about the present, that, that one day, just as, as this happened so long ago, we're still communicating a truth about God. He's promised us this land, and, and even though we, we, will, we would all agree that God does not command genocide, they're saying, look, this story, this parallel is not to be taken 100% literally, but what it is meant to communicate, it's meant to communicate that God will restore the land to his promised people. So that, that's one way that you could, you could do this. The other way you can, you can read it when you look at these texts in this way is you could say, well, maybe you reject this idea that it, either that Deuteronomy was written in the 8th century or, or BCE, or um, if we don't reject that idea, you know, maybe we're saying, like, well, this is a more accurate historical account of what happened. Fine, fine, fine. Um, <clears throat> but now, in, instead of saying simply, this is, this is what happened, and this is what God demanded. Let's look at how people have encountered God. We, we see the trajectory in Scripture, right? The trajectory in Scripture moves us from a place of, uh, of not following God, of not being in obedience to him, right, to a place of obedience to God, to a place of, uh, uh, a place of following God more more closely. Um, and, and the trajectory of scripture that we see is a trajectory that takes us not just from the, the, the past to now, but the trajectory of scripture is a movement. It, it's a movement from an exclusive gospel to an inclusive gospel, a movement from, from a, a, a truth that was to a specific nation and, and group of people at a particular time to a group that's a universal truth that's that, that's for all people instead of being restricted to just salvation for the jewish people and the jewish people only we now see that salvation is available to all salvation is available to the gentiles salvation is available to the jewish people that that the whole world shall be saved we see even in, in paul's writings where he says that at the name of jesus Every knee shall bow and every tongue confess that Jesus is Lord to the glory of God the Father. He goes through that, every being in the earth, above the earth, under the earth. We, we just kind of read through that. But, but really what Paul's getting at there, uh, or, or the writer there of that, that letter, is getting at is that in the realms, how, how they perceived the world in the natural realm what was in three sections, right? This idea of this flat earth. And we've got God up in the heavens above, all the beings up there with God. We've got humanity here on the earth and, and down below is the underworld where, you know, the, this idea here of uh, Paul would have been exposed to this idea of Hades and so on and so forth. Not, not the concept of hell as far as the, the, the Greek concept or, or the, you know, necessarily burning in a fire, although Paul may have had that, <laughs> that there, but really this idea of Hades as the place for the souls as this Greek idea, this Greek audience that he's writing to. And um, Paul's saying that at the name of Jesus, every knee shall bow of every being, all the beings in the heavens, all the beings in the earth, and all the beings in, in Hades, in the underworld. Every single being in the entirety of the universe, as far as, as, far as Paul conceived it, will bow their knee to Jesus. <laughs> and, and so... This is, this is the growth and the, the trajectory and the path that we see ourselves on. This is the path that we see ourselves on over and over again. And we see this trajectory throughout Scripture no matter how you slice it, no matter how you look at it. And I think it's vital that we, we begin to engage with the text in, in a more precise and a more serious level. Rather than just a surface level reading, we need to look a little closer. We need to look a little deeper at the, the historiosity of different things and the, the different beliefs and various items that may have been uh, perpetrated by a certain group of people. It is so important that we look at these things and see what they actually mean. Um, let, let's look here at a few quick places. In John 15, Jesus refers to himself as the true vine, the true source of life. Again, if Jesus is the true source of life, uh, and uh, you know, why would Jesus look any different from God? In fact, in John 14, um, you, you're familiar with this, but Jesus said, have I been, uh, verse 8, or verse 9 rather, um, have I been with you all this time, Philip, and you still don't know me? Whoever's seen me has seen the Father, so how can you say, show us the Father? Remember, Philip said, you know, Jesus, just show us the Father and it'll be enough for us. Verse 10, don't you believe I'm in the Father and the Father's in me? 
The words that I say to you, I don't speak them on my own, but it's the Father who dwells within me. He does the works. Believe that I'm in the Father, verse 11, the Father's in me. But if you don't, just believe me because of the works themselves. Jesus said, if you've seen me, you've seen the Father. You have seen God if you've seen Jesus. So I will submit to you, again, in looking at these three ways of looking at God, this is why I come back to number three, that not that God changed, but rather our perceptions of God did. They've grown over time. We've got the prophets who, who speak and say, like, yeah, sacrifices are fine, but God's really after mercy, not not judgment. God's not after sacrifice. If he wanted, uh, you know, a stake, the cattle on a thousand hills are his. What he is saying, though, what the prophets are saying is that our, our view of God has grown over time. And it's fine for us to track this growth. It's fine for us to look through these things. And, and there's benefit and meaning to these stories. And we see you know, in Deuteronomy, knowing when it was written that this, this promise to people that God delivered the land to us once and he's going to bring us back to it. That's a powerful way to read that scripture. In fact, uh, <clears throat> I, I came across something the other week where it talked about, you know, ancient Jewish, um, or not ancient, but Jewish scribes and, and, and rabbis and things like that, um, particularly around Jesus' time and uh, even up to nowadays, and a lot of them referred to this, this idea of multiple levels of truth within the scripture. And, you know, something in the Western world, we tend to think of if it happened, like, literally, that's the most powerful thing. In fact, that's what a lot of us were indoctrinated to. Um, but really, in this, in this view and in this mindset here, they're saying, no, that's actually like the lowest form of truth in scripture. The highest form of truth is is the lesson is the story is is the parable is is the concept of god that the scripture is trying to get across to us and that's what we see when we begin to engage with scripture this way we begin to see god afresh and anew through a new lens through a new mind through a new a new mindset where where these instructions uh to wipe out either were how people perceived god and we see them growing beyond it or it's, it's we're, we're using this kind of coded language with a wink and a nod to each other to say God gave us this land before and he'll bring us back to it. it. It completely changes how we read this. But the picture of God, I'm convinced again that the picture of God that we see must look like Jesus. Jesus said again, if you've seen me, you've seen the Father. If you've looked at me, you've seen God. So if our God looks nothing like Jesus, well, what do you mean a God who looks nothing like Jesus? How many times have you heard, and I've, I've heard a number of things over my life, and we're, we're getting ready to wrap up here, and if you're getting anything out of this, go ahead and hit that like button. Um, but how many times have you heard over the years that certain, certain natural disasters, certain things like this, uh, tornadoes, hurricanes, shoot, I even heard 9-11 um, growing up. This was something that we had brought on ourselves, that God was, was judging this country or whatever country you're in, that these disasters were God's judgment on you for a certain particular action, whatever the case might be, or judgment on the country um, you know, for, for uh, allowing homosexuality to run rampant or different things like that. I heard those kinds of things all my life, and they, they, just, they never sat well on the inside of me. Um, because that God looks nothing like Jesus. We don't see Jesus doing that. In fact, you know, if you, we, we looked the other week at the woman who was, who was caught in adultery. And uh, when, we, when we look at her story, we see that Jesus didn't bother to correct her. It didn't, didn't tell her. I, I mean, at the end, he says, go and sin no more. But Jesus pushes everyone aside. Jesus doesn't rain judgment and hellfire down on her. If he, if he would have, he would have said, go ahead and stone this woman. Instead, Jesus said, you, you who are without sin, you be the one to cast the first stone. You go ahead and do it. And nobody could because everybody had, had sin in their own life. And Jesus restored this woman and said, you know, go, go your way. Go, and, go sin no more. Live your life. <laughs> but the, the God we see, again, looking at the scripture here, the God we see must by necessity look like Jesus. There's, there's no two ways around it. That if Jesus said, if you've seen me, you've seen the Father, God must look like 
Jesus. And that's what we're going to talk about in this series. I'm convinced if we begin to reset how we read Scripture, reset how we read Scripture, it will change how we see God fundamentally. So, so this is what we're going to do. This is, this is the great reset. We're going to you know, do, a, do a reset, a detox here, so to speak, on how we read scripture, how we look at God, how we view the divine. And when we see how we, tra- when how we view God changes, when how we view God changes, the big thing that changes is how we treat people how we treat those around us. The, the, once the vertical nature begins to change and we don't see God through this vindictive lens, we don't see God through this lens of, of guilt, of shame, of, of God's going to get you if you do this and if you go off. And No, instead, look at God as God is love. God looks like Jesus. He, he's, <laughs> you know, this is who God is. This will change how you treat people. This will tra- change how you interact with your neighbor. This will change how you interact with those on the other side of the aisle politically from you. This will change everything. This will change how you view everything in life because I'm convinced that our orthodoxy, I said this the other week, our orthodoxy will always drive our orthopraxy. What is that? Our belief will always drive our actions, how we live. Orthodoxy always drives orthopraxy. So I'm convinced we need to reset our orthodoxy. We need to look at God fresh and anew, see his character, see if it really does line up with Jesus. It, it is the God that we've seen, the God that looks like Jesus, or have we been taught a bastardized version of God, a bastardized version of the gospel, where, where we're ready to sit there and make God ready to, you know, be like Zeus and rain another lightning bolt down on somebody? Or are we teaching people that God looks like Jesus? God looks like Jesus. And that's where we're going to pick up here next week. This is, this is going to be good. <laughs> I'm excited for this series, probably the most excited I've been in a little bit. Um, you know, and, and, and I, I'm convinced that our view of God has to grow. It has to change. It has to evolve in order to become in harmony with who Jesus is. Thank you guys for watching. We will see you next week. Hey, thank you so much for joining us. Listen. If you got anything out of this video and, and you want to learn more about By Grace International, what we're doing here, you can go to our website. It's bygraceinternational.com. There you can join the Grace Tribe. You can get our letter. Be the first to know of anything we've got going on. And second, if, if you want to support us financially, you're thinking to yourself, you know, hey, I love what you guys are doing. I want to be a part of it. How can I help you get the word out? You know, we, we offer everything here for free. We don't want to put anything behind a paywall. We don't want to do anything like that. So if, if you feel like that's something you want to do, you can go to our website, bygraceinternational.com slash give. I've got a, we've got a secure giving form there for you. We're a nonprofit, uh, 501c3 tax deductible uh, organization. So you'll get all of that receded to you, um, you know, every year for, for, for your tax purposes and all that. And, you know, we just, we, we want to be a blessing to you. This helps keep the lights on, helps us be able to keep doing what we're doing and keep Uh, getting the word out, getting, you know, telling people just how good God really is. And and maybe you were taught like I was that, you know, God will give you the desires of your heart. All you have to do is just desire something and God will give it to you. Well, I'm not quite sure that that's really what the scripture teaches. And if you want to find out more about it, you can go ahead and click on this video right here.